And that was a, that was a moment of going, right, the key to this is not these like long scripts that I've been learning and it's not really the technique as such, it's just something about that person's ongoing experience in the moment, which I'm, I am kind of, it's up to me to manage that. All right, welcome everyone back to the School of Greatness podcast. We have the legendary Darren Brown in the house. My man, I'm going to gently yeah, shake I've, your hand. I hurt my hand. You've, I've been having a lot of powerful LA handshakes this All week. All the power players are and just they, gripping you. and they, they each hurt very much. So I, appreciate, so I appreciate the gentle, of course, quite British uh, handshake, in fact. Thank How's you. the British handshake go? Is it like a dead fish? Like, it, yeah. Hello. Like you have to maybe, you're supposed to guess how much it weighs or something. Okay. Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, I first learned about you, I think, in 2010, somewhere around then, when a friend of mine... I believe James Woodmore was all into magic. He used to be a magician himself, like when he was a kid, mm. and he just appreciated the art of magicians and mm. mentalists and mm. illusionists. And he turned me on to you, and I kind of went down the rabbit hole then. Kind of lost track of you for probably four or five years, but kind of picked it back up recently because you've had a number of specials that have come out on Netflix that yeah. blown my mind. Thank you. One called The Push, which Literally go watch this tonight on Netflix. If you're listening to this or watching this, I'm telling you, it's going to blow you away. If you appreciate anything that I've done in this show, you will love this. And without telling the whole thing, the push is essentially you get people to kill people <laughs> on video. And that makes it sound just that, just you get you get people to <laughs> kill people, literally, but no one dies but they think they're killing someone. Yeah, it's an exercise in social compliance. It was to see whether you could, through, through, well, through yeah, ordinary social compliance in a big sort of hidden camera setup where there's one real guy who doesn't know he's in this kind of Truman Show environment, uh -huh. everyone else is an actor, just starting with little things. Little lies. The little lies, whether it could build to the point that he would murder. Um, it's unbelievable. It's just mind-blowing. And you watch it at the end, it's like, it just makes it, it's so suspenseful the whole way through. It's kind of anxiety inducing, It's so isn't much it? anxiety, it's, but yeah, yeah. really, it's like making a murder on steroids. <laughs> and with like a mad scientist behind the curtain, you're like, you know, me. it's like, yeah. it's so funny. You're talking about the psychology of the whole thing all the way through. It's it's beautiful piece of art and just very entertaining. Go watch The Push. Then you have a, a new show out called new in the US at least, called The Sacrifice, or Sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah, this is brand new. And yeah. this is freaking mind-blowing because it's perfect timing with all the elections that have been happening and all the different things in social media where people are against each other. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to build walls everywhere, they're uh, excluding people, or comparing mm -hmm. each other against other societies and countries, and there's a lot of fear in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think you eliminate this fear by creating another experiment, a social mm. experiment, where you get someone to, who is essentially, um, well, I'll let you explain it because I don't want to make sure I say well, the Maybe I should first of all explain that. So my background <clears throat> is in magic, and but the kind of psychological side of magic and working a lot with, excuse me, with suggestion and uh, uh, I even began as a hypnotist. That was my kind of first yes. weird way into all of this. Um, but as I grew up, the desire to just kind of like do tricks and go, hey, look, aren't I clever? Which is kind of the subtext, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of grew out of that. So uh, although I still do stage shows that are kind of a bit more like in that traditional mm -hmm. mode, uh, the sort of 20 year, 18, 20 year TV career I've had in the UK, I appreciate no one really knows me here, but in the UK, I've, I've sort of, what I tried to do was, was take the idea of, of sort of magic and make it into something that was dramatically more resonant. So now what I do is I'm kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. and <clears throat> deception is something we're all part of and in on apart from normally one person. So it's quite separate now from any kind of magic. It's not really about that. It, it's, it's an experiment. Yeah, these really are. Yeah, these are, these are kind of social experiments, um, but with a a view to normally changing and transforming something and doing something worthwhile. And you're, so not, this, and you're not necessarily in 
performing the act yourself. No, you're, you're no, behind, I'm, you're like letting yeah. other people. You're like orchestrating yeah. the, the the trick or yeah, the experiments. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to actually like and persuading. It's kind yeah. of so I'm using <clears throat> the kind of psychological techniques and the kind of the, the um, just the power of sheer like production and and like actors and stuntmen, all the kind of stuff around it to create. Pressure, create this, authority, all these things yeah, that make you say To yes. get someone to a certain point. And I've, I've done various things with that over the years. So this new show, Sacrifice, is taking uh, a guy, so an American guy who's, um, He's you know right wing guy and he doesn't like immigrants. That's his. Doesn't thing. like immigrants. Doesn't like immigrants. Particularly some, illegal immigrants. And he likes people who it's like if you're from here, great. If you're not, we don't yeah. want you. Yeah, that's kind of his bottom line. And I, the he, challenge is, <laughs> I get him to the point. So he so he thinks he's taking part in one show, uh -huh. which he thinks is a documentary. So he knows he's taking part in a show. Often when I do these things, they have no idea there's even like a TV show going on. But he thinks he's taking part in one show, which is a documentary about, he thinks he's got a microchip that I've implanted it's in him. It's amazing. Oh my and gosh. He, he thinks he's That's trying That's going to enhance the performance out. or something, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's trying, like, so he's got a motivational thing, this biotechnology. But the actual agenda of the show is to, is to try and get him to the point where he willingly takes a bullet and lays down his life for an illegal Mexican it's immigrant. unbelievable. And the scene at the end, yeah. when he has to make the decision, I don't want to spoil it here, but when he has to make yeah. the decision and you watch his conscious, and it's unbelievable. Again, you guys got to watch this because at the end it's going to blow you away. Um, it was, it was a really emotional it. journey. It's it so really unbelievable. Was, yeah. And I hope it was as powerful in person as you guys made the production. Yeah, yeah. Even uh, more, maybe. Because these things take... Like months, ten months right. oh of maybe gosh. of work, because because it's for not one only moment. for one moment or for one yeah, because you're not only creating that moment for the guy Phil in this case. This guy's called Phil. I stop calling him the guy, um, <laughs> but also you, it's it, you're also having to create everything as a completely convincing fiction for somebody. So there's not only not only you got to make it work as a as a kind of a story, but this guy can't know that. That this whole it, again, it's a Truman Show. You know, you can't yeah. you can't break the fiction for the person. So uh, it's amazing. It's it's there's a lot. Yeah, there's a there's, there's a lot involved. We did a show called um, Apocalypse, uh, which was which was ending the world for somebody. So here's somebody who's um, kind of gotten he's sort of disengaged from life. He's like kind of selfish. He's, he lives with his parents. They're like, look, you, you've got to change this guy essentially. So. Um, I took the stoic idea that you you value like we need to value what we have more, and one way of doing that, and the Stoics, which were you know mm -hmm. the, the, this big philosophical yeah. philosophical school, five hundred years before um, Christianity sort of burst into the scene, they were there was for the most Stoicism, yeah. popular. I'm sure you've mm -hmm. spoken about it with many people. So I I'm a big fan of the Stoics. So I took this idea. So the idea was okay. So how do we take everything away from him? in order to have him value what we have. Appreciate these things, yeah. So we <laughs> ended the world. So what we did, we took, we had cameras in his house, so he'd applied to be on the show, right? There's normally some application process, and we vetted him and we decided he'd be robust enough for it, ideal for it, and also suggestible enough. For it. I look mm -hmm. for people that are naturally quite suggestible. And then you tell them, hey, you're not on the show. Yeah, exactly. We're not, we're not gonna use you. And months later, you come back and like. And then know. months later, we put cameras in his house, so his family are in on it. He's like 20 something, you know, 23, I think he was, lives with his family. So we got hidden cameras throughout his house and we began this process of convincing him that the world was gonna end through a meteor strike. So if you imagine like he's watching TV shows where they have like guests and scientists uh -huh. on, but we've like re-recorded our special versions of it that are only playing on his TV. That he knows that like an authority. It's yeah, like yeah. He just incredible. thinks it's a regular episode of his show. We had control of his phone. We hacked into his phone so that we could send him like on his news apps and things like. Even oh the NASA God. site, we were able to create convincing replicas that we could drop in these news stories. Um, I was tweeting as his favorite because he was quite into science. Uh, tweeting as his favorite scientist and so on. So bit by bit, we drip fed this idea. Wow. He'd be out in a cafe that we knew he was gonna be in and we'd have the radio playing in the background with like real DJs that he knows, like famous UK DJs, talking about this ending. thing. Is like, is it gonna happen? Is it not? Is it a hoax? And then we created this like pyrotechnic event for him where the world ends. No um, way. And then in the second part of the show, he wakes up seemingly weeks later in a hospital 
Um, Shut up. And everywhere's deserted. There's no no one around. And he <laughs> he <laughs> he then begins. Basically, he he goes through the plot of Wizard of Oz. He learns the important things. He learns about courage. He learns about uh -huh. having a heart. And learns about leadership. Um, and you know, th kind of having a brain, I guess, is that other sure, part sure. of the Wizard of Oz thing. But it, and he finds his way home, and and finds wow. his, uh, and fi he's finding his way back, and kind of claiming himself, right, as a as a as the best version of himself. And he finds a few other people, but there are zombies. There's no easy no way, way of saying it. There's this whole kind of like zombie. Plot. I haven't seen this one yet. I gotta oh, watch this great. one, dude. It's, I gotta watch is, this one. It's great. So these are like, yeah, these are big, elaborate, quite cinematic. It'd take years um, for you to plan out, probably. Yeah, at least it was. To think it was. About. It was. You huge. did another one, I think. I read. I haven't watched some of them because they're not in the U.S. But I, there's another one you did where you like, the guy's afraid of flying, and you like help him overcome his fears, and has to like. And then he has to land the plane. Land the plane or so something. So again, that was like crazy. I, I could imagine an airplane. For, everyone's an actor apart from you. There's hidden cameras. Then there's a medical emergency. Can anyone land this plane? This is at the end of this big transformational experience for him. He goes. He gets up. He rises to the challenge. Says, "I'll do it." And he's ter like, terrified of flying. Has to get, <laughs> no, no idea this is being filmed. He um, goes to the kind of like the cockpit to go in and, and do this. He's, again, very suggestible, so he's kind of conditioned. I can put him mm. to sleep very quickly. Wow. So I step out. He doesn't know I'm there. I step out, hypnotize him. We land the plane. He's like, asleep. you know, we land the plane. We then get him to um, one of those very convincing um, he's simulators. simulators he's right. asleep. He's asleep. He then wakes up and steps into that. <laughs> then he goes through this whole, like, plane landing experience, which is completely <laughs> convincing for him, and comes out. And I don't know if you've seen the game, you know, that Michael Douglas film? Oh, it's the film? best. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's a constant reference oh point for me. Oh, my gosh. So he comes out, and it's like a big party, like, at the end of that. Like, all these all his people that are there that were part of the journey and, wow. and so on. I've kind of spoiling the ending of all these it's shows. Right, no, but Sacrifice is the new one. I didn't one. spoil the ending for Sacrifice Sacrifice yet. is the only one I've done that's kind of, like, I think... Resonant and the kind it's of so relevant too. Yeah, I, whatever yeah. you guys do, go watch both of these: the push, the sacrifice. Right now, we're going to talk a lot more. But um, and then you have a stage performance, which is just. I hope you edit these things because if you don't, you are like a like a perfectionist with your words on stage, and it's really annoying because it's because <laughs> when I speak on stage, I'm like, man, I wish I could present that way. So hopefully, there's some editing in these things because it looks like you never it's miss just, a word. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's like you do quite long tours. I do. So yeah, I think exactly. it just, it just so times, gets yeah. in there. Yeah. But you, um, you do something which I thought was fascinating, which is you kind of demystify these like faith healers that yeah. try to manipulate. Because I think there's a lot of great faith healers or people in spirituality mm. that help a lot of people, bring them mm. faith, bring them like peace of mind, mm. bring them you know inner peace. And there's uh, some that and there's some that try to manipulate to get more money out of you. Yeah, yeah. That say like I'm healing you and give me more money. And then create a, a bad cycle of self blame. Absolutely, self absolutely. And, so on. Um, and you create this yeah. experience on stage, which it just blows my mind, where you recreate it. You say, listen, mm. you know, I'm I don't believe in God. I think you said that mm. like I'm an atheist, and but I'm going to heal you today, mm. and I'm going to show you through the power of suggestion, the power of influence, the power of yeah, like all these yeah. other you know, stage performance techniques yeah. that these fake healers do. So this show is called Miracle, it's which is also on Netflix. Basically, those three, all three shows you are watch the last all. three shows that I've done, and they're all on, they're all on Netflix. It's amazing. Um, the rest of it, you'll have to dig around on YouTube and uh, my YouTube exactly. back catalog. But, um, but, but this one, you get everyone to like, you're like, if you felt a healing in the, on the audience, you're like, stand up and come to the back of the room. And there's a line of like 300 people who yeah. had some type yeah. of healing in like, Three it minutes. was, you know, it was amazing. I think I've toured for like twenty years in the UK, and in each, I do a brand new show every two, every two years. So this show, Miracle, was like one of the recent shows, and in that whole experience, that kind of career, nothing, nothing was as interesting as doing this every night, and see, because you basically there's there's kind of two components to this idea of faith healing, at least as I see it, and certainly as I was doing it, and I was learning from the faith healers and using their techniques. Mm -hmm. One is adrenaline, so you create, as you know, you know with your own background, uh -huh. you're not really Peak feeling state, pain. Yeah, feeling like, yeah. yeah. So if you get adrenaline going, it's a painkiller. That, that, that's the first thing. So if, you, if you've got a, like, if you've got some back pain, and you know, a, a you're slouched line, in a bad, yeah. A wild lion walks into the room, you're not worried about your back, right? You, right. The pain goes, so you, you, adrenaline kills pain. That's the first part of it. The second part of it, which is where it gets really interesting, is the stories that we tell ourselves, which is a, a recurring theme in my interests and mm. life and work, and how we get restricted by that. And what, was, what I didn't expect was 
the, the power, I thought it was going to be people saying, oh, I had back pain and now it's gone. But within a week of doing the show, I remember a woman coming up in floods of tears. She was maybe in her 40s. She'd been paralyzed down one side of her body since being a kid. And for the first time, she's able to move her no arm. Way. And this is how you can, of course, she can start to go mad as the healer and start to believe in it, right? And believe you're like a god. Starts to take an effort to think that, yeah, exactly, this isn't something I'm doing, this is something you're doing. So that psychological component. So basically, it's like this the part of our, you know, the, not for everybody, of course. I'm only dealing with a percentage of the audience, yeah, right? Yeah. So you, I got maybe two, three thousand people in the audience, mm. and here are three hundred, right? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're kind of numbers yeah, are getting. Most smaller. people aren't feeling it, or maybe they didn't have pain, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then the number that get invited up is smaller again, right? It's like the more um, suggestible people, or the more the, like the people. Yeah, exactly. The people that certainly experience the most. But the fact that, you know, if you X-ray this woman before and afterwards, clearly nothing has changed, right? But mm. her. Somehow, in the story she was telling herself about this condition, I can't move my arm, this is something I live with, it's a restriction that I have. Maybe the, a bit of adrenaline at the start, and then the kind of the, the challenge of like, you know, if you, if you couldn't move something before, try it now, notice what's different and come up and tell me. Just that sort of, blah, 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 okay, I'll think about it differently, just snapped her out of it. Um, and she is, I mean, she's not just feeling a difference, she's actually kind of physically moving. And night after night, these things happen, and it varied from night to night, and some nights were, were more dramatic than others, but uh, that was, it was extraordinary. And then, and again, percentage is getting smaller, right? Yes. So now we're in the top, like, probably half a percent, which is always going to be kind of extraordinary, but people then saying, like, a year later, this is, you know, Cured. this was a permanent thing. Again, I'm thinking, it'll work for 10 minutes when they're on stage. <laughs> right, because they get the adrenaline, and yeah, they're... Yeah, but they'll, they'll go back, yeah. and they're going to be as they were, which is, which is where those healers, where it starts to get nasty, because yeah. then they're saying, if you... If this healing doesn't last, it's you know it's your fault. You didn't mm. have enough faith, and so on. So that's where it gets nasty. So I, I'm being open and saying, look, you're going to go back. It's probably going to be the same. Don't throw those pills away, right, right, right. regardless yes. of what I said earlier on. Um, but some it, people it, was, it works for. It, so it <clears throat> continued to work. Well, here's the thing. You know, my my girlfriend uh, Jen, she's a doctor of physical therapy, and she she works on people who are in chronic pain, right? right. Who are broke, yeah. who 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 pulled muscles, who like have bad neck pain, you know, back pain, knee pain, all these things, joints. And she'll get them on her table mm -hmm. and literally have them start changing the story around. It's yeah. an emotional thing that they're holding on to. They're just yeah. really tight. Yeah. And when you get people to relax, yeah. they can usually move better yeah. and the pain goes away. And so the way you were doing it, I was just watching. I was like, wow, you're just getting people to really relax. You have them take deep breaths. You have them like I think close their eyes at one point there was a and kind see of, the yeah, best there was a version of yourself. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't really even relaxing. <clears throat> it wasn't like a because you can't stand on stage and have people just relax for twenty minutes. Right, no, right. you know, it was it was it was it was just a it was just it's like crazy, it, was, it was it was it was crazy. And it, and uh, and then I started to think, well, maybe I could um, maybe I could like present this as a as a thing, because you could pack out Stadia if you said this is a secular healing show, you know, I'm not making any claims, and, but that's what that is when you start to go mad, because we never advertise it's a healing show, because then, But you course, heal people then, or people are Yeah, but you don't better. want people coming to the show no, wanting no, no. healing, because yeah, then, yeah. then you're into a kind of a dark area. So well, anyway, yeah. Was, what you do, which is even cooler, is you start to guess where people's, or not guess, I shouldn't say that, but you start to call out where people's where pain people's is. Where people's pain is, and, and yeah, you're just, yeah. by looking at them, it's like your left knee, and they're like, what? It's like, yeah, my left knee can't, you know, yeah. whatever. And that isn't someone going, <laughs> which yeah, yeah, exactly. would be a little obvious, but, but yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but again, I'm using I'm using the techniques that the healers that the healers use. Really? And what are, what are those? Are you allowed to share? Or? Um, I I kind of like to, you know, I always find if I if I say, oh, this is how mm. this is how they do it, people then go, oh, okay, well, that wasn't how the healer I saw. Or the psychic, you know, uh, I do a lot of stuff debunking like psychics and mediums, mediums yeah. and I never say exactly how I'm doing it. Because then people go, all right, well, that's not how my guy did it. Got it, yeah. But, you know, I've, I've sat in those... Um, You've studied a lot of them, right? You know that, well, yeah, and like, I mean, talking a bit about some of the methods which are kind of unpleasant, but you know those, like, the, stu the studio audience type of psychic, like the TV psychic, the medium that comes out and there's a big audience. I've sat in that audience. I won't say who it was, but he was certainly a big name a little while ago. And uh, he came out and... You have an audience of believers, of course, right? And mm -hmm. he comes out and he's saying, so is there anybody here who's hoping that someone's going to come through? So, like, you know, 50 hands go up. He said, well, tell me, and I'll let you know if they come through. So who are you hoping will come through? And people start to just tell him everything he wants to know. And is there anything that I can look for that would be absolute proof that no one could possibly know? And they, 
tell him all these things. Yeah, it was my son, and he died, and this, and it's just heartbreaking. And then they start taping, and of course, you know, he comes out and says all those things. Oh, really? And it's ho horrible sitting there, and you kind of think, God, it's, it's like there's not even, like if you're a magician working, I have to work so much harder because you've got to prove you're not cheating, yeah. in inverted commas, prove. You know, you've got to like show there's nothing up your sleeve and then still do it. Whereas, he's asking questions before, yeah, yeah. yeah, when you've got yeah, an yeah. audience of, of believers, it's different. Do you but believe it's because the lie's so bad. I think, mm. I think that's why people don't believe it. You'd yeah. rather believe that that was really happening than that, you know, that, that Do you believe lie. there are mediums that, or individuals like that who can connect on a different way, or is it No, I, th I think, I, I don't. I, I think because it's, it has been tested, it's been looked at again and again, it never holds up. Never once in the history of that business, which is like maybe the second oldest industry in the world, uh, it's never, it's never holds up. And, and our capacity for, I, I, I did this one, um, in one of the stage shows I did, I, I had people up on stage and I did, I did mediumship, right? But I'm debunking it as I'm doing it. So I'm saying, really? I've got your grandmother here, her name's, is, her name's Alice, is that right? They're like, yeah, and she's How saying, do you know the name? and she's saying, that's, that's my secret. <laughs> and she's saying, and she's not saying anything, I'm lying to you, you understand this, but she's saying she had a little dog called Jasper, is that correct? Yeah, and she's, uh, I'm making this up, she, and, and I'm so you're like, making it up. so I'm debunking it as I'm doing, I'm saying I am lying to you. And she's you're making it up, anything. or you had other I'm not making, well, I'm telling gotcha. them correct information, but at the same time, I'm saying, I am lying to you. Yes, know? yes, so, yes. So it's a kind of an interesting, I, Felt theatrically kind of an interesting right. sort of weird play. Anyway, so after the show, there was a girl at stage door who said to me, um, could you put me in touch with my grandmother? And I said, well, <laughs> I hope it was clear from the show that I can't really do it. I'm kind yeah. of debunking it. She went, oh, no, no, I know it's fake and everything, but would, would you be able to put me in touch with my grandmother? And it was just a really interesting moment of like our capacity for that kind of dissonance to like hold those twin uh, ideas. And you had the completely conflicting. Um, is, you know, extraordinary. So our capacity to essentially kind of fool ourselves, I think, is mm. so... To want to believe. Yeah. To yeah, want to believe that yeah. this person can or that this person's yeah. Yeah, connecting through someone somehow. To yeah, me. exactly. And I think there's, there's a lot of that you've got to get through before you reach the possibility of anyone doing it for real. What do you think is your greatest superpower? Because I, I think you can do a lot of things extremely well, and you, I feel like you're a mash, you're a student of life and understanding people, and you've been doing this for a long time. But what do you think is your greatest skill set? Oh, you know, you're very kind. I'm happy if my you know breath smells okay in the <laughs> afternoon. Um, you have a uh, weak handshake. I understand. My, <laughs> my if I have a toolkit, mm -hmm. like if a you know a magician has got his you know deck of cards, or whatever. I think yeah. my toolkit is people's is people's stories that they tell themselves. I think that's 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 what interests me. It's like it, can you give me, an example? Well, or? so like <clears throat> like even just like a magic trick, right? You are. Um, when you watch a, you might watch a card trick, and you go, you know, he, he, he had me pick a card, and then he put the card back in the deck, and it disappeared, and then it was in my, it was in my pocket. That's impossible. Now that that is a story you're telling yourself, and you've, you're going from point A to point B to point C, but of course there's like also a point one, a point two, uh -huh, you know. But uh -huh. you, what the magician's doing is just encouraging you to edit the story in such a way that. Probably, normally all the sleight of hand happens right in front of you, but you don't pay attention because it doesn't seem important. And then the bits that do seem important are the bits that later are going to join up to form the story, right? And they're a little, like there's a, when I used, to, I used to do a lot of this kind of magic, and like a thing I'd always say is, so let's say you've got like a deck of cards at the beginning that is in a special order, so you can't shuffle them, but there's a point halfway through the trick where they can shuffle them. I would normally say at that point, okay, look, shuffle the cards again, but this time do it under the table. Right? So they follow that instruction, but it sounds like they've shuffled the cards before to them. Does that make shuffle sense? Shuffle the cards again. Because I say shuffle the cards again, but this time do it under the table. Now they haven't shuffled the cards before because uh. they were in a special order. But then later when they're reconstructing the trick in their head, let alone when they're then telling someone else about the trick. I shuffled the card a bunch of times. Yeah, I shoved it at the beginning. You know, and it's, it's like a false memory that you start to implant. Yeah. So, wow. so, uh, so, you're, you're so it's just, yeah, you're just working with stories. And so what I do, because I'm like the sort of magic I do isn't really like, uh, you know, proppy. It's kind of like more based around suggestion. Yeah. So it really is. There's, there's also conjuring in it as well. I mean, sure. I'm, I'm using magic techniques too, but largely, like the bit that interests me and the, the story of it is just yeah, it's people's ongoing perception. When you meet people, what goes through your mind first? 
not trying to ask you like about me, but just in general, like what goes through your mind when you see someone? Are you always thinking of like, I wonder if there's a way I could tell them a different story to like create an aha moment, or I'm just curious about this individual, or, or are you just kind of I, I, not thinking anything? And no, just, do you know what? I th I, <clears throat> so there's, uh, the work that I do is like, is very sort of controlling. Like I seem to be able to control people's minds or control people's actions or whatever. Um, I actually think that's a terrible way of living. I'm, I'm a big believer in the, in the stoic idea that you're, there's like all the things you can control and then the things you can't control. If you try to start controlling things that you can't, you're, gonna, you're just gonna get frustrated and angry and anxious, right? Mm -hmm. But the only things you can control are your thoughts and your actions and that is it. That is it. So you have this choice. You try and control all this other stuff, or you could just decide that it's fine, that everything else is fine. And the thing is, it always is. It always is. And if you let that thought of, so like, you know, your, your partner is driving you mad because essentially they handle stress badly and they're putting, or putting it all on your head or whatever, whatever that is. And it, it's sort of like you can, you're in charge of how much you maybe do try and help them or, or how much, uh, how much, uh, how much, how kindly you can meet them. But you, you, but essentially, if they handle stress badly and they're having a bad time, like you, you, you can emotionally separate a little and go, that's okay, it's okay. Uh, and, and in that sort of clarity that comes with that, then you can actually be like a better partner mm -hmm. and be a better help, mm -hmm. as opposed to making it all about you and turning it into a huge big thing that you don't need to do. Um, so there's like, there are gray areas, but essentially, uh, so it's like, I'm sure sport is the same. Mm. Like, um, so you, if you go into, I, I don't know, tennis, you go into a game of tennis, if you, if you try and control the thing you can't control, which is the outcome. So if you go in thinking, mm -hmm. I must win, I must win this game, yeah. then what happens? You start to lose, you become anxious, you don't play as well. Whereas you can go in thinking, I will play as best as I possibly can, the best of my abilities. And I'm not going to react and be negative, and I'm going to yeah. control well, my actions. Well, it's yeah. just a different story. <clears throat> so you're, in yeah. the, you're in your thought, you're on this side of the line, and of course you play better. You do actually play better, so the results tend to be better. But you're just, you're just trying to keep it on the right side of the line. So there are these, there are kind of, you know, like matters of social injustice that you think, well, that's not fine, that needs changing. Well, fine, but then just, emotionally commit yourself to doing your absolute utmost to change that thing, not to an outcome that mm -hmm. may, that m this may not be the time, that may be like, it's gonna be years after you've done your efforts yeah. that that's gonna change, but you'll do a better job because you'll be less bitter, you'll be less frustrated, you know. So, so what I'm saying is in life, I'm like, you know, the least controlling person. <laughs> Actually, what, you, what I think is more important is to have a, a, an easy relationship with, um, Fate, fortune. You know, the Greeks used to, they really believed in this thing called fortune that, you know, they, so imagine a graph, right? And I, I love this image and it comes mm -hmm. up. I read a, a book on, on happiness and this, I, f I just found this a recurring image um, from, from the ancient Greeks onwards. So imagine you've got like um, an X, like a X, your X axis and your Y axis, mm -hmm. right? And a, is it that way or is it that way? I don't yeah. remember. But, so along one axis, you've got say the y-axis is your aims, the things you want to do, the things you want to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like that axis. This axis down here is just stuff. It's fortune. It's stuff that life throws back at you. It's stuff you can't control. What we are told again and again and again is if you believe in yourself enough and if you set your goals clearly enough, you can sort of, the life you lead, this line will be kind of up here somewhere, really in line with what your goals are. Um, and... I mean, that can work sometimes, and that's great when it does. But what you're not then respecting is this, the stuff that just happens that you don't have under your control. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is like when people, if people, like we call people losers now, right? Like they've lost, which we used to call them unfortunate. So there's a slightly more sympathetic right. uh, approach to um, when things don't go right in people's lives. So what I think is important is that actually what we live is an X equals Y line, right? We we, um, we try and do certain things and we try yeah. and pull the line a bit up here and then life pulls back a little bit. And you can either let that drive you mad or you can just let that settle in as a kind of, uh, th that's what life is, right? That's what life is, which is whether you make your peace with that or not. Are you like a, 
like a dog that's pulling at the lead and like this all the time, or are you kind of trotting along a bit more harmoniously right, with it? So right. this, I, I think, this is, I think, a, a really, uh, a really big thing. And that same idea comes up. Do you know Michael Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote Flow? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So he's he he studied it's like amazing. yeah, athletes, uh, surfers, musicians, yeah. chess players, anyone that had like a Zen state, like a state of flow where they felt this is the best version of me and I'm achieving the most and and what he saw was that they're in this X equals Y line of uh, you can, you imagine like you've got your, your skills on this side, you've got the challenges you're facing on this side. When your skills roughly match your challenges, you settle into this flow state, like you lose any sense of like time yeah. and those things, uh, regardless of what the skill is, like a lot Anxiety, of people experience Anxiety, anything, you're like all that just zone, go, yeah. yeah, you're just in the zone, you're in the zone, right? If your skills are greater than the challenges, you kind of get bored. If the challenges are greater than your skills, you get anxious, but there is this X equals Y line. Uh, Schopenhauer, like great uh, 18th, 19th century um, German philosopher, uh, said, you know, if you, and I guess it's so relevant today when we're just told believe in yourself and set mm -hmm. your goals. Like, if, so if you're playing a game of chess, you, if you start out, you start out with a plan, but if you just stick to that plan all your life, if you, if you stick that plan to the game, it's, it's nonsense because like someone else is playing, so you have to adjust, right? Mm -hmm. So again, you've kind of got this idea of moving harm. Freud, Freud who started, you know, psychoanalysis, he wasn't trying to make people happy. He figured life is pretty much unhappy a lot of the time. Suffering, yeah. So, yeah, so he said, that, uh, well, I'll, I want to restore what he called natural unhappiness, as opposed to un <laughs> unnatural unhappiness that people have. Natural but unhappiness. Just natural unhappiness, he called it. And none of this it's sounds like, it's like kind being of... like being in the UK, yeah. No, like, yes, like living <laughs> with our weather in the UK, <laughs> yeah. and our teeth. Um, but, the, you know, and it doesn't sound kind of like, you, you don't sell a lot of books with those kind of, it's a sort of pessimism, it's like yeah. a strategic pessimism yeah. it's been called, you know. But, but I think actually it's, a little bit of that is valuable. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it's like the faith healer that says, if you don't continue to feel better, it's your fault. You've let yourself down because you didn't have enough faith. And if you swap out That's faith for self-belief, like, I don't know if you're a fan of like, you know, the secret, but mm. it's the same model. Yeah, yeah. And it says quite explicitly, if you, if these things don't come to you. It's your fault. It's your fault. It is your fault because you you let go of that self-belief. And it's, it's a recipe, for, I think, for anxiety mm. and disaster. Do you face a lot of anxiety in your life? I don't. No, I, I don't particularly. I, 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 I have the opposite problem that I'm... I'm <laughs> you're too I'm, relaxed. <laughs> I'm so good at avoiding anxiety. How do you avoid it? Because I, I just have this natural constitution that I just avoid stress, but then I don't, I don't the difficulty is getting stuff done then, isn't it? Like, anxiety is really important. Because you need a little pressure to complete things. Yeah, that's our signal that something needs changing in life, right? You have a if deadline, it's like, I've got to do this thing, or yeah, something's yeah. not working, I've got to make a change. How do you change, you don't change your job, you don't know it's wrong unless you start to you know, hate your job. You don't cross the road on your own without letting go of your mother's hand first, right? Something has to die in order for something new to, to live, right? And like, I'm... 47, um, so as you get kind of into the middle bit of life, you start to mm. notice you kind of like your ego has to now just settle down and you actually putting yourself in service of something that's bigger than you, like whether it's, you know, your kids or a, or a, a passion or whatever it is, that those things start to become important. Let, you know, things have to sort of, you have to let go of some things to, you know, to, um, to, to move on, to to move into you know growth but you don't yeah. grow unless you embrace some level of anxiety it's, it's tough so i find that difficult because like i'm i'm to the opposite and I, I need to embrace a bit more anxiety probably in life do you feel like uh, did you used to have a bigger ego at one point have you like started to kill the ego off for yourself oh, but, but, I mean, you know i was a magician it's just awful it's embarrassing <laughs> it's you, you know trying to please people or trying to like oh I'm trying to impress it's just terrible because yeah. it is you, the bottom line of magic is, is look at me aren't i impressive that's yeah. it that's all it has to say it is the quickest most fraudulent route to impressing people mm -hmm. and there's a wonderful magicians and i you know i love great magic of course but there's a lot of grown-up lonely children in that world because mm -hmm. you you're you you learn to have you know show somebody something that is a cheat you know it might be actually really easy and they go you're amazing you're amazing and that's a quite an addictive uh, yeah. cycle so um i think I've, I've hopefully let go of some of that but i know i was i was i was i was unbearable like i couldn't why did you have a conversation without doing tricks? Really? Yeah. Because you just wanted to, Because you wanted that. It was like the drug. It just felt like it always felt good. It was that hit. Yeah, and like we don't like people that are trying to be impressive, and that was mm. like such an obvious truth that I just hadn't quite realized. We like people that are kind, and we yeah. like people that are, are nice to be around. 
good we listeners and yeah. Yeah. Not always trying to get all the attention or whatever, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And interestingly, we don't like people that necessarily like us because we always try and be like people that we try and be like people we admire to get them to like us. So we, mm -hmm. we instinctively try and, you know, be like them. And actually, it's not really what we necessarily are drawn yeah. to in people, I don't think. Why were you uh, so into magic or un un learning about all this stuff in the first place? I remember hearing a little bit about... As a really insecure, like kid who needed to impress and feel solid. Um, I was, uh, I, I, I saw a hypnotist in my first year at university and I, it kind of, so I was studying law, right? I was supposed to be a, a lawyer and it, this, I s saw this guy and it just ticked all these boxes. It was mm. performance. I'd never really thought of myself as performing but I think that I needed that. And the control side of it was like it was it was a great show. It wasn't making people look stupid yeah. at me, but it was it was nonetheless. I kind of a bit of me was like all those the kids that I found like intimidating at school, those kind of sporty sporty guys. guys that like you, you'd have terrified yeah, yeah. me. Like me. Yeah. Big guys. Yeah, they're now like the they're the ones that tend to respond really well to this kind of stuff. So now I'm in control. You know, it was all that kind of stuff. Interesting. It was. It was um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully I've grown out of some of that right. at least. But that's yeah, why you that got was, into it in the first place yeah. from insecurities, and it was like, absolutely, yeah. Wow. When did you realize that you had like a gift for this? Because I'm, a, did you were you just all of a sudden funny and interesting and a great storyteller in the first like few months, or did you bomb a lot <laughs> and <laughs> get embarrassed even more? And uh, it, it isn't a gift, I don't think. I think it's it's like if you have that insecure thing or whatever that makes you start playing the piano, right? Like probably not everyone's going to play the piano, but mm -hmm. anybody who could in, in theory, you just got to put in thousands 10, of hours, hour, 10,000 hours, yeah. whatever, whatever the figure is today. Um, uh, but not everyone's going to do that. So uh, it, it, yeah, it clicked for me and it, it um, but that, it's, a, it's a slow process. I remember mm. one weird seminal moment. And, uh, um, I was the guy at university that would hypnotize you, right? That was my thing. So I would, people would come over and I, I was learning hypnosis, so I'd sort of, you know, practice it on right, people. So repricing and every I, day, just all the time. Yeah, yeah, all the time, all the time. So, and I, I would leave, like if they were good, if they responded well, I'd leave them with this suggestion. If you come back and I click my fingers and tell you to go to sleep, you'll go straight back into the sleep state, right? And, and it, if people are highly suggestible, that will, that will work right, with right. them. So, and it just would, you know, speed up the process the sure, second time. Sure. And this guy came one week and I thought I'd seen him before. So I sat down, I said, click, click. I click my fingers, go to sleep. And he went, he went out. And he went we, to sleep. He went, he went to sleep. He went, well, it's not sleep, but he Why? went into this kind yeah, of, yeah. Relaxed, relaxed, state. Uh, yeah, yeah. This relaxed state. And we, but essentially went into a trance. That's what it looked, you did the, you know, he slumped out and we did whatever we were doing. I can't remember what it was. Maybe, you know, he wanted to give up smoking or something like that. And then it was only afterwards when we were talking about it. And I realized I hadn't met this guy before. So I thought, well, how did he, because like, I don't have moment. magic fingers or something, nothing I'm doing. <laughs> and I just realized it was just my, my <clears throat> kind of commitment to that. I did my confidence and my belief that he was going to respond just, and the fact he was very suggestible was just a, like a <clears throat> fortuitous coincidence. And that was, a, that was a moment of going, right, the key to this is not these like long scripts that I've been learning and it's not really the technique as such, it's just something about that person's ongoing experience in the moment, which I'm, I am kind of, it's up to me to manage that, and if if um, so now on stage I get people up and I shake hands with them and they collapse out on the floor, hypnotized, in inverted yeah. commas, whatever that yeah, means. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a whole other discussion as to what it is, but I know that that moment of stepping up on stage is bewildering, and there's suddenly an audience right. and there's desperate. lights and they're like, yeah, and, and they just yeah, boom. all yeah. that, and desperate for direction, desperate for clear instruction, which is like a gift if you're a hypnotist because you know that whatever you say will just unconsciously, Work. you know, yeah. Wow. So, so I, I, someone tried to hypnotize me once, and I was like, I want to be hypnotized. I was like, you were too enthusiastic. Well, I was like, first off, I was like, I never want to be hypnotized, and okay. I'd watch it's not it a good and things start, like that. Yeah. Well, this was back in the day. Yeah. And then I met a guy who was like a hypnotist, and he was like, you know, well, I'd love to like show you and guide you if you want. I was like, all right, I'll try it. I'm yeah. open to it. Like, yeah. I just don't know if it's gonna work. And he's like, well, you need to come to the space that it is going to work. And that's what he said to me. He was yeah. like, I want you to, yeah, you know. You want to be this. This is something you want. Like we're gonna work on it, whatever. And he did the whole like arm pull thing or whatever, and it just wasn't working. Like, <laughs> and I was trying to was like, pulling your arm. Well, it was so just like, like a quick like, like you know. Oh, that's like, like a stage setting. Like, yeah, it was just like a little yeah. you know, like, I don't know, like a little pull where be you. Careful, that doesn't really. Oh, really sorry. Excuse me. Don't break the hand. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
But at the same point, I was like, okay, I'll just like try to like go along with it and and really just try to more relax in like the yeah. process and just try to like be relaxing, breathe and relax. And um, he took me through like a pro like a visualization of like becoming your your greatest self. He actually put me through an actually nice process because I mm. love the power of visualization. Mm. I've, I've been doing it as an athlete since as long as I can remember. Sure. And I believe in the suggestion, the story we tell ourselves, yeah. the projection. I would say, this is how I'm going to show up tomorrow at the game. And I'd walk myself through yeah. every move, every play, every whatever it may yeah. be, and yeah. see myself performing well. And I'd also be putting years of hard work to back it. So yeah. it wasn't just like, I'm going to do great with yeah. no work. Yeah. But recreate, re reaffirming that belief. And so he put me through a nice little kind of guided visualization, meditation, whatever we want to call it. And he was like, I want you to imagine the greatest version of yourself standing right in front of you. Mm. And in that moment, I'd actually never heard the way he told it before. And then I was like, wow, I could see myself mm. like with 100% confidence, calm, poised, like mm. the best looking version of myself, whatever, just like standing perfectly, not slouched, just every part of me, the best version. Mm. And I was like, wow, I can push myself to be a greater person. Mm by seeing it first and then taking the action steps to becoming that. Yeah. So I was like, that was a nice little... As long as you build in, <laughs> build in <laughs> this kind of sub-clause uh -huh. that... Because like people can set these kind of goals that last forever. Joseph mm. Campbell, I'm sure, you yeah, know, a big yeah. writer on myth, said, you know, you can spend your life climbing a ladder and then realize you had the ladder against the wrong wall. You know, there's, there's like, so there's... It's, I mean, it's why wonderful. Are we like, doing, why are we this, climbing the ladder, right? Yeah. Like why or, are we climbing this? Or yeah, we well we yeah we spend a lot of time focusing on stuff like this. We have this image of this version of ourselves that we're moving towards, and it's always out there somewhere. And it's kind of like all those things that like well that look it's helpful. Like if you're gonna have a self image, of course, why not have a great self image? Because mm -hmm. we tend to make terrible ones, but yeah. it's just an image. It's just a picture in the head. It might as well be a good one. Yeah. But uh, in the meantime. There's also like the here and now, and there's like mm, making being your yeah your relationship to the to the parts of you that aren't right is or, or don't feel right, and making peace with that and understanding that in a different way. Like you know, if you're in a relationship, and uh, I heard this as a philosopher in England called Alain de Botton, I really love this. He said, like if you go to sleep, if you go to bed twice a week with your partner, and you're thinking, what am I doing with this person? This is terrible. That's normal, right? That, <laughs> that is like a normal right. thing to start with. And that's to me, is much healthier. That kind of thinking is healthier than, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have the perfect relationship and I can visualize that perfect and I'm gonna make it happen. Because mm -hmm. sometimes that's great, but sometimes it just sets you up for a kind of, why have you know, an impossible standard? So there, there's smart. a balance, right? There's a, I think there's a sub-clause yeah. that goes, if, if everything turns out brilliantly, then yes. Right. But, you know, but if it doesn't, then yeah, that, has, that has to be okay. Yeah. That has to be a situation that's comfortable and also, you know, exciting. Why not, you know, why, there's, 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 why not also be happy with things Where as you they are? are? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's, it's an important bit that gets missed. Yeah, appreciating and being yeah. in gratitude and all those things. What is, um, do you have any regrets of all the work you've done or just anything in your life where you regret maybe something you did or something you didn't do or something you wish you'd done. And I have no clue what you're gonna say here, but I'm just curious if you have regrets from whether your personal life, your career life. I, I, um, <clears throat> I was, it's difficult, I was thinking like, um, a friend said this, which I thought was great. You know, Richard Wiseman, if you come across his work, is mm. a kind of popular psychologist, he's great. So like you know, it's like trying to pull out a, a um, like a big jar with loads of different colored threads. You know, you just sometimes you try and pull one out, but of course it just all comes out together. So how you <laughs> how you go back and like remove one thread from your life? But mm. um, so I'm I'm gay, but I didn't I didn't come out till I was like 30. So that's like that's kind of late. Um, 17 years 17 years ago, right? So yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's like I do kind of think. That's normally where my mind goes. Like, well, do you, really? Do you regret anything? Because that's like a really long time. But I don't think I'd put half the energy into sort of doing the stuff that I do if I didn't, if I wasn't A, desperately trying to avoid any conversations about sex and just like basic, you know, human conversation. So that like, you, you tend to get very good at like deflecting uh, attention mm -hmm, with, mm -hmm. you know, dazzling, amazing yeah, things, right? Tricks. That's like a yeah. good strategy if you're trying to avoid that kind of subject. So, you know, weirdly that kind of helped. Um, 
And so I don't know. You so you know, can justify these things as well. You're like, well, I wish I would have came out earlier, but at the same time. Yeah, and you know what it really, what it, what it really did. I think it would, gay or straight, or whatever. There, we, we often have things about ourselves that would be good to come out about, right? Stuff that we just carry a lot of shame around about. And we thought, God, I could never tell people. And what's fascinating, and why the coming out thing, regardless of what it's about, not necessarily about sexuality, just anything, if it's something to come out about, and this is what I found, it's liberating, not because you get to go, oh, I'm gay, or I'm whatever, it's that you realize, like, no one gives a fuck, no, yeah. no one cares. <laughs> And Maybe in two or three people or something. Yeah, but they don't, yeah, but... That's it. We would, the, the, <clears throat> what really settled into my head was this idea that we'd worry a lot less about what other people think of us if we realise how seldom they do. Right? Wow. They really don't really care. So once you've done that with your big thing that you've carried all this shame around for, then you realise, oh, oh yeah, everything's fine. Wow. So because of that, I, other than, I was probably a bit of a dick for a long time while really? I was like struggling with all that stuff, but that's I kind of you know you got to forgive yourself that. Came so, in peace with it, yeah. Yeah, so I don't I don't know have any regrets. It's yeah. absolutely kind of it's fine. I'd like to be you know I, I kind of I'd like to be a better partner and a better person and a better, those those mm. are things that I think are you know good to engage with in, right, in right. the present. Yeah. Is there anything you're struggling with right now? Is it like or what is the biggest challenge for you? Because you don't have anxiety. You're oh, and I hate, look, I have anxiety. I don't, don't think do. I don't. I just mean my, my, I'm, I get so good at natural. Avoiding it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't have anxiety like some people have anxiety, but I, there are, like, there are different patterns, aren't there? So you've got classically anxiety pattern and avoidance pattern. So like if there's a stressor, if there's a challenge, if there's something in your life that comes up that's stressy, do you run towards it like a magnet and try and fix it, like some people do, it's what my partner does, it's like, <laughs> absolutely, like, that makes it worse, I think. Yeah. Um, but are you drawn to, are you drawn to stress, yeah, yeah. or do you just naturally avoid it? I'm very good at avoiding it, but that isn't, both sides have their ups and downs, right? I like, I, but we, then it kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of nice, we work well with each other because we, he makes Come me a little more engaged in things, and I, you know, help him calm down a bit yeah. about other stuff. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I'm kind of, what I find interesting at the moment is the tension between the urge. It was kind of like what you were saying about the, the, is that the Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche, he kind of had this mm. line of become who you are. That was his, mm -hmm. that was his drive, right? So there's, there's that one idea of that there is a, a version of you that's out there somewhere that you want to clear everyone out of the way so you can just, you know, focus on that. Uh, and I think, as you, you know, if you get married mm. or you've, kids and stuff, that, that kind of tension, that sense of like, mm, 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 can be very strong. And then there's the other completely conflicting impulse, which is, well, maybe the best version of myself, rather than being out there somewhere, which I'm never going to reach, right, mm -hmm. is <coughs> actually right here. here. It, how, maybe the self is something that extends and is sort of active and fluid and extends out into the relationships and, that you're in now. But, you know, both are important. What's, what's hard is, and I think this, you know, is just generally in, you know, in life is, is hard, is is the uh, like you know conflicts ambivalence is important and again real it's part of life that things conflict and things are ambiguous and things are you know messy and and that that's okay and actually it's, it's okay to let completely conflicting opposing ideas settle like I mean, look right, it was right. I mean the politically you know we're we're so like this now that we each think the other side is just is just like mad and evil and we've kind of forgotten that which is kind of what sacrifice uh, is about oh, is yeah. we've forgotten that actually the dialogue between the sides forgetting the personalities involved but the dialogue between the sides is actually where where you find humanity and where truth is ultimately going to be found right you've, you've got two very different narratives about you know the conservative urge is essentially about protecting the group right it's about mm -hmm. holding <clears throat> things well, together, hierarchies, yeah. holding that together, but it can happen at the expense of the weaker individuals. And then the left-wing narrative is about protecting the weaker individuals. And, and it doesn't, tearing down... Yeah, and yeah, letting, yeah. It doesn't, if that can happen at the expense of the overall yeah. structure, that's, you know, that's fine. So, but, you know, sometimes we think as, sometimes we do have to think as a group, and sometimes we have to think as individuals, and we've, we've evolved, like, along both lines, yeah. and both sides ultimately are going to are going to be important. So, you know, dialogue is important. And likewise, in life, things are messy and they're complex mm -hmm. and they're ambiguous. And there is a, you know, 
growing up is tolerating ambiguity, I think. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> what is your greatest fear? Uh, or fears? You're going to forget about my hand and give me a really hard handshake at the end of this. <laughs> uh, I don't like spiders. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, greatest fear, I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, I think kind of, you know, I think getting it all wrong. You know, maybe letting, I hate the idea of like letting, letting my partner down. Mm. Like, you know, just sort of letting things and people down, letting myself down. I kind of, re I really, I really think about these things and try and get them right. And I try and communicate them through the work that I do. And, and uh, you can only ever be good enough, right? Again, it's not about ever being... You can Perfect. give your best, yeah. yeah you, can, you, you can't can control just, how people respond or react. Exactly, to exactly. To the way you show up, right? Yeah. So it's not a kind of anxiety fear, but in terms of the things that I think about that, uh, you know, I, I, part of me, as I said, wants like everyone clear out the way and I just want to pursue these things, but then what am I going to be? I think, I, I think I'd become this great, fascinating version of myself. I'd probably just become some weird old man. You know, we, we cross state, don't we? We develop like a sort of a hard shell when we're on our own for too long. And what relationships do is they make you more conscious mm. of all the things that are just mad about you. Because otherwise you're unconscious of them. And it's the things you're unconscious of that will own you and will come back and bite you. So relationships are so important. But because I'm naturally kind of a bit of a loner, it's like, like I'm mm. really aware at the moment of that tension. That, that for me, in the kind of middle bit of life, that's kind of, that's what I find really interesting at the moment. Wow. Since you are, you do like to be alone, it sounds like, and be kind of in your art and your crafts and your photography, like isolated in some mm. sense of the word. But I'm hearing you say that you, when you are around people or your partner, you don't want to let those people down. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I, it's, well, yeah, because that's a potential for sort of, right. not only letting other people down, but just becoming this intolerable, horrible version of myself. <laughs> gotcha. so it's, it's, that, it's just gotcha. trying to get that stuff, you know, trying to get that yeah. stuff right. Are you like how old are you? Sorry. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay, yeah. so you've probably got a while before those sort of things <laughs> start to become uh, start to become pressing. Well, I think uh, you know I w I've been talking a lot about this in, in uh, just in my work that, and through all the people that I've interviewed over the years of different backgrounds and stuff, there's really three main fears that I've found that yeah. most of us have. Yeah. Uh, the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. We don't go after something or pursue something or. Mm speak or do music or whatever it may be because we don't want to fail yeah. that, that fear of like oh, I'm a failure I'm a loser right yeah. the fear of success where then we're leaving our pack our community because if mm. we're succeeding and they're not coming with us then I'm alone and they're not mm. going to accept me or the pressure that I have to perform again mm. I have to repeat mm -hmm. the success yeah. right yeah. you might have felt that when you had this hit show and it's like it's got to be better it's got to be better right and then the third one spiders Spiders, yes. Mm -hmm. Spiders and snakes and heights. Mm -hmm. uh, the fear of judgment. Oh, uh, yeah. Of yeah. either way, or, you know, making sure that people like us, uh, you know, fear of like, well, either one. If I succeed or fail, are people going to like me? And for me, the judgment is always was always the fear until I addressed it about five years ago. Because as an athlete, I was taught that you had to fail to succeed. Mm. And I was the youngest of four. I was the the... I was this tall when I was like 11 and just like goofy and gangly. I wasn't like this stud athlete or whatever. <laughs> I was the one that everyone made fun of. I had a, uh, you know, I was in special needs classes, so it was hard for me to read and write all through college. Almost flunked English in high school, all those things. So I had a lot of insecurities about the perception people had about me. Right. Like my image, my yeah. ego. Like, yeah. what do they think about me? What do they say about me? Am I, sh am I saying the right things? Like, I always yeah. thought I was off. So that judgment was what drove me to be a great athlete, to succeed, to achieve, to perform well, and to win at everything. Mm. So it was like accomplishment driven. And <clears throat> I realized that failure wasn't a fear for me because coaches taught me you've got to practice. You're going to miss shots. That's how you learn. Mm. So I was like, all right, I'm going to fail every day, and it's mm. okay. That's mm. the foundation for achievement. And that's all I wanted was the success. Mm. But it was like, did I slip? Did I look silly? Did it, you know, the fear of like yeah. what people think about yeah. me. 
Yeah. So you're still living that out, though. That's what's interesting, isn't what's it? What's that? You're still living that out, that same fear of judgment. You're still living it out, but you've, you've turned it into something. I'm aware of it. I'm yeah. very aware of it. I, well, I started to accept it, and, and five years ago, I, I opened up about being sexually abused as a kid, and I've talked about it many times on this show and you know, wrote a book about uh, all that stuff. And it wasn't until I fully opened up about all my fears and insecurities about that and many other things. Mm. It wasn't until I like opened up about it, and my fear was like everyone's gonna judge me. Everyone's mm. gonna, no one's gonna love me. No one's mm. gonna accept me. Like mm. they're just gonna make fun of me even more. Yeah. And I had everything to lose, right? Mm. I, I had a successful business and career and everything, but I was like, no one can know about this stuff. Like mm. no one can know that you're gay, whatever. Mm. Maybe that was a feeling. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, totally. And for me, it was like the most shameful thing that I held on to for 25 years, yeah. or until I was 30, and. Um, but when it happened, I was like, man, this weight, like no one, no one cares. No one cares, yeah. And in fact, they cared more about me. At that moment, they were like, well, I respect you more. I trust yeah. you more. Because I felt like something was, your ego was in the way. And when people are like that, when people have that thing that like people when they're closeted, for example, about uh -huh. whatever it is, it's always a bubble around them. Like I, I knew I had it around me and I had friends that have kind of come out since. And there's just a bubble and you just can't quite get to them because they're because they're something constantly missing different. right yeah, yeah constantly, something yeah. and that was that was and me, you were I probably mean. doing the same as, as was i and then so people only people only go ah and they step in closer it's a nice it's it. a good experience and all of a sudden you. everyone was telling me vulnerable things about them that yeah. i never knew and i was like wow well, we can connect on a deeper yeah. level yeah and it's a whole it's an amazing thing to kind of discover isn't it it's such yeah, a simple thing for everybody else but it's an amazing thing to discover but once i kind of let go of, listen i still have an ego and like you know i want to you know, perform well and all these things. I want to do a good job and, and and do all that stuff. But it's like, I care so much less about the way I look and the way people are judging me. Because I'm like, they're gonna judge me whether I'm doing nothing or doing something. Mm. Either way, the people are gonna judge me for a moment and then they're gonna let go and judge someone else, like whatever. Mm. Mm. And so I think I've come to the point where I've accepted mm. myself. Mm. And, because I used to not think I was enough. And that's why I was like constantly living in one of these fears. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think once we can start to just accept who we are, as opposed to saying, "Well, I'm not the perfect version of myself," like you were talking about, let me be where I'm at right now and appreciate the moment. And I, th you know, I think the most we can hope for often is just being conscious of these things. Like yeah. There is, there is a. We can't always. It's you know, it's not easy just to go, "Oh, great," and then change anything. But you, being conscious means that it yes. owns you less. So, like, we, yeah. from the from the word go, we are we come into this world, and we are given. Powerful messages from our, you know, parents, our caregivers, our authority figures, mm -hmm. kind of going. Here is the relationship between you and the world. You are, you are small. The world is big. You have no power. The world has power. We learn very quickly what what that is. What what are? It's a skewed vision. Mm. We have, you know, Jung talks about the greatest burden the child has to bear is the unlived life of its parents. How great, how great is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's like right on us from the word go. Putting the pressure, yeah, yeah. But we are adapting creatures, right? The thing that makes us so great at evolution, because we adapt, really starts to kind of fuck us up a bit with, with, with this sort of life thing, because we, we adapt to that. We internalize it. We go, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll think of myself like this, and I'll think of the world like this. And we start to kind of live that out. We develop a template of what love means from our parents which is entirely realistic uh, unrealistic because mm -hmm. you see all the nice stuff like they presumably hopefully please god give us the best side of themselves but we don't see the arguments they have when they're you know we know what it's like now as adults yeah, what, yeah. what the experience of parenting is like we don't see them screaming and arguing and I losing sleep maybe yeah, well yeah, yeah, yeah maybe you did yeah, yeah. um but very often at least so there's a there's a sure idea of like this uh -huh. template of what love is that isn't isn't really like realistic and we start to bring that into our that becomes our template for our adult our relationships story, because that's yeah. all we know right and then we're projecting all of that stuff onto our and onto expecting our certain things yeah and we live out these same patterns everything comes back again and again because we we just the stuff we're not conscious of is the stuff that that, that rules us and we bury you know we, we bury one part of us like like if you're you know if you're the the, the homophobic I don't know, a homophobic televangelist who, uh, you know, preaches against all that and then gets, you know, caught in bed with some right, guy and there's like right. a big scandal. It'll come back and bite you if, you if you bury these things, you know. So the most we can do, I think, is become conscious of how we adapt in these ways to skewed messages, mm. skewed, you know, our, our compasses are all over the place. 
we internalize it, we think that's the truth, and then we go through life kind of looking for things that in a familiar way repeat that pattern. Mm -hmm. So people can have the same problems with relationships again and again. Because that's again. what they know. Because that's what they that's know. That's what it's supposed to be is true. How do you think, no matter where we're at in our lives, how do we rewire and master our mind? How can we say, You're you know asking what? me like I know. Bear in mind, look, the only reason why I have any language for this stuff is that, you it, study doesn't, this that stuff. it doesn't come naturally. And if it came right. naturally, if it was all sec, I wouldn't have the language for but it. But that's why you're an expert, because you've studied this, and it, with all the experiments you've done and all the people you've worked with, just by observing people, how do you think, I feel like you've had thousands of interactions with people where you've been able to set things up for them, tell a story or not tell a story to have them go in a certain direction. So how do we rewire our minds to at least be aware of what we want, what we don't want, and how do we become more of a master over our minds as opposed to it being a master of us? I think we set our goals realistically. We allow for failure to be comfortable. Mm. We align ourselves with that X equals Y line and not try and crank everything up here because if we're trying to do that we're just buying into someone's system somewhere and we're just make, we're going to make life miserable for us eventually and we're going to blame ourselves when that happens what do you um, mean failure comfortable meaning be okay with failure yeah to let to let i mean even is it even failure i mean i don't know it's just mm, a it's different it's just experiences isn't it's it so learning, it's just, yeah. yeah how you make <clears throat> that make your peace with the fact that life isn't going to always produce what you'd like it to and make make that okay um that's huge and as i said become the best we can do is become more conscious of these things now that so that can happen through psychotherapy right a psychotherapist is going to hopefully um and like depth psycho like psychoanalysis yeah. that kind of thing increases your uh your sort of dialogue with yourself increases increases your consciousness about those things but it's very expensive and it's long form yeah, and a lot of people yeah, aren't yeah. interested but that's one way of doing it Another way, I guess, is to is to look honestly at your life and see well, where are these where are these recurring patterns? What mm. about what keeps cropping up? What am I a bit obsessed by? What am I constantly trying to avoid? What am I? Uh, what just keeps coming back and biting me? What does life keep keep throwing at me that's that's like that's bad and causing problems? And then we just tr trace that back, see where it goes back to. And are there any other? possibilities of any other ways of behaving and it's not like it just goes great and then you change but you become more conscious of it and then it's like a little drip by drip mm -hmm. feeding into the soul that yeah. you know can, can make a difference I think I think you know <coughs> I think these, these are sort of modest sure sure modest sure. goals yeah of course important. I'm curious who is um, more influential in your 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 youth mm -hmm. mom or your dad to you more influential well to you. Uh, both my dad may be kind of in a sort of negative sense. I mean, we, there was not like any bad blood, but this is quite common, I think, with like mm -hmm. boys that are gay growing up, is that you tend to have the stronger bond with the mother and the father's sort of, there's just kind of a bit of a disconnect there. So, um, but of course, both end up being hugely influential because both of those impulses um, inform who you are as, right. as an adult. So, uh, well, I was closer to my mother, certainly. Mom, which closer, is, yeah. 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 What was the greatest lesson that uh, your mom and your dad taught you? Well, um, well, I, I heard recently somebody say, it was so great, how great is this, that um, uh, kids spend their life wanting their parents to apologize. Mm -hmm. Parents spend their lives wanting their kids to say thank you. Isn't wow. that nice? Isn't that a nice thing? Wow. Um, and I, uh, because I studied law, I, I was surrounded, like neither my parents, like my dad um, barely read or write, and neither of them went to university or anything, anything like that. Um, so, I, but here, so here I was amongst all these other law students that were like from these really big, powerful sure. families, and, and uh, they were, that first set of exams we came across, I saw that they were all really um, nervous, not because they were gonna fail for them, but what their parents were gonna say. And I'd never had that experience. I couldn't relate to. So your parents would. Your parents would be angry at you for failing, and you know. So I and I wrote. I wrote my parents a letter because mm. I just suddenly realised. Oh, they actually they've done like this amazing 
thing of just saying, you, you know, you just do what makes you happy. And they'd never tried to, the only thing they ever wanted me to do was learn to drive. And that's the one thing I don't do. I don't drive. You don't drive. <laughs> I was so like incensed that they try and... Uh, you still don't drive? I mean, I still don't drive. No way. Uh, which in LA here is just that's like... That's quite a good thing. You don't, illness, need, you don't in need London, to, yeah. no, it's, In London, it's fine. Right. Um, so, um, I've kind of slightly lost track of your question, but... Uh, the greatest lesson that your from mom them, yeah. and so your that dad was it. taught you. That was it. It's like... Uh, like I, you know, I feel I've done kind of well in my life, and that what they were giving me was just uh, do what makes you happy, and that's always been my impulse. I've had no, genuinely no ambition, I'm, which is why I'm kind really? of like cynical about the whole goal setting thing. I've never, never done that. I only felt is what I'm doing now, in, you know, enjoyable and interesting and feel worthwhile, and and that that was on. Day one when I graduated wow. and I had no money and I was just doing magic tricks. And I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. I quite like this. I'm walking around dreaming up tricks and then going out and performing in the evening. That's nice. And that is exactly the same now. That, like, doesn't, that hasn't But it's on a bigger scale changed. now. It's a bigger scale, but like, being kind of successful with what you do doesn't really, doesn't really change those things. You mentioned like, the fear of success. I, I have a good friend. I found this a really interesting thing. He um, built up a company. Uh, so it's... Pulling back, he was um, he had a relationship with his father, where he felt he had to achieve and show achievements to get approval. Love, right? love, approval, yeah. exactly. Very like really common, really common. Again, in terms of those yeah. stories that we get in from an early age, and then we just kind of adapt to it and think that's what we have to do and think that's real. So, he his way of responding to that um, was that he had to be a really high achiever. Um, and you know the world becomes dad, right? The world becomes you know wanting approval from from everyone. So he built up this company, and he had this dream that I'll build up this powerful company, and then mm -hmm. I'll sell it, and I'll be a multimillionaire. And I guess dad will love me. I guess then, yeah. yeah essentially, brackets, you know, dad will love me. Um, and um, he did it. He built up this company, and this is a very good friend of mine. And he sold it, and he sold it for a lot of money. And then he was in therapy within like a year because that need, that thing, that doesn't go away. Like that's the thing that has driven him in his life. Now he's done the thing, mm -hmm. he's achieved the goal, so now what? And he yeah. went to therapy and realized that he was not alone. Like this is a really common thing. This is another whole thing with the goal setting. There isn't just the problem of what if it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. What if it does work? <clears throat> What if it works and you've spent like I'm still 30 happy. years making it? Yeah, because the thing that was making you do it is still there and now it's got nowhere to go. And that's like, then you've got no meaning. And like, forget happiness, meaning is like what, what we need, right? We need to make sense of ourselves in the bigger scheme of things. So what happens when that goes out is horrific. But, you know, great for him because now he's, he's like become he's aware conscious of, it. of yeah, that he's stuff aware of it, now. Yeah. So he's, he's worked you know, a lot of that stuff out. But That was my... That was kind of my upbringing as well as like I wanted to prove people wrong. That was my meaning. Yeah. It was like a negative meaning. Yeah, it was yeah. like the three to five bullies that picked on me in school yeah. and told me I was stupid and laughed at me when I couldn't read in front of the class. Like that stuck with me and I was like, I'm going to become so big, so strong, so athletic, so talented that I'm going to prove these kids wrong. Mm. And I did, right? It's like I achieved all these accomplishments and went on and did all these great things or whatever. Mm. And I was like, why am I still not proving happy? Them wrong. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I'm proving them wrong, but why am I still yeah. not happy? Yeah. Like, I did the thing that they said I couldn't do. Yeah. And I still don't feel good about myself. It's because you never reach the point. You, you'll never reach the point when you fully prove them exactly. wrong. You're, you're still. There's proving, always another thing. There's another thing. Keep proving them and wrong. so I stopped, I stopped that as well. I was like, okay, instead of trying to prove a few people wrong that I don't even talk to yeah. or whatever, and don't even remember their names, it's yeah. like, yeah. why don't I shift my meaning and purpose towards lifting others up mm. and, and serving humanity? And serving people in a powerful way to support and educate, entertain, whatever it may be, mm. to to help people as opposed yeah. to get back at people. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a good one. That's a good idea, right? Yeah. And that yeah. that that gives me so much more meaning, and it and it strips anxiety from me. Does and it? it strips anxiety, and it strips like the fear of judgment, mm. because when I I've been speaking on stage for about ten years, I used to be so terrified to speak on stage. And I went through a year of public speaking training in Toastmasters just to force myself to dive into the fear. Because mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want this fear to control me anymore. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I used to, um, you know, I got good at speaking on stage, but I still get really nervous before. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until about three years ago where <clears throat> I talked to a guy who was like a coach of mine who was like, 
because you're still concerned about what people think of you. Yeah, you're yeah. focused on like yeah. being perfect and missing a word or forgetting a story. He's like, you're gonna mess up. Just own yeah. the fact that you're not gonna be perfect yeah. and quit focusing on what people think about you and start thinking about them and yes. being of service to them. Yeah, and, and the idea, so I think, I think a lot of that fear of public speaking is helped by the realization that it's an idea that you're all engaged in, that you're presenting mm -hmm. and everyone's learning about and you're engaged, it's not about you. Which is also the difference between yeah. proving those people wrong and being of service mm -hmm. to humanity, as you put it, is that it's not about you. And I think things get better in life when they're not about you. So like, much better. I, I can't think of any job that you don't become better at that job when you stop making it about you. A teacher that's just looking for kind of, you know, approval of the kids to like him and all those things, it, it's not going to be as good as the teacher that's genuinely <coughs> about serving those, that's it. those kids. And it's... Um, and public speaking is the same thing. That's the trouble we focus on. It becomes about us. And yeah. that's just going to drive us mad. If, if it's about the ideas, mm -hmm. uh, if it's about, it's again, that sort of middle life thing, I think. Yeah. Just letting go of ego and serving that's something it. bigger. We find meaning in life by finding the thing, something that's bigger than yourself and that's just throw, throwing yourself into that thing. Let's go into that because you, you talk about being an atheist, right? Yeah. And... Did you grow up believing in God or in a religion or, and then when did this shift? What was the idea behind that? I, uh, okay, so I grew up, I didn't have like a religious family or anything, but I went to a sort of Bible reading Sunday mm -hmm. school type thing when I was quite young. So there was a teacher at school I really liked and she ran uh -huh. these classes. So I, I went <coughs> to that and I, so I just, you know, believed in it. And then by the time I was old enough to realize, oh, I, I actually have a belief that not everybody has. I was kind of, you know, I was pretty inculcated, so yeah. that well, you know, wasn't going to shift. So that was fine. I, I didn't have a lot of Christian friends or anything, and I, um, but I had one good friend at university, at school first and then at university. And then um, it actually started to change with the, the fact I was learning hypnosis and magic mm. because it, it was, there was such a, a negative reaction, such a strong ab reaction from my Christian friends of you the, performing these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you like, shouldn't, like, that you're tampering. With, yeah, 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 exactly. And I thought, well, okay, that's that's just them not understanding what it is. So, okay, that's sort mm -hmm. of, all right. But that's, that's, like, just fear, isn't it? And then, yeah. and then um, so, so that was the first little drop of a kind of skepticism. And then um, I had a friend who was a psychic healer, and, and we used to have long arguments because I was so skeptical about that kind of stuff, which magic tends to teach you because you learn about you know, how a lot of, how, how, you know, how we fool ourselves, right? And how tricks work and naturally, you know, so we, you tend to become quite skeptical about those sorts of belief systems. And I started to think, well, I'm just, am I just doing the same? Is it just another circular belief system? So I thought, well, I should, you know, in, I should really look into it. Maybe I should try and, because uh, I was the guy that would sit you down in a pub in England yeah. and tell you why you should believe in God. Here are these you arguments. would do that. Yeah, I was that guy. Like I in, could, in I like could high prove school, to you. College. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was. You were hardcore into. I was pretty hardcore. Wow. And I could, I could prove <clears throat> to you why God existed. All those things. But part of me thought, yeah, and like for two thousand years, philosophers have like not been able to answer that mm -hmm. question. So probably right. I'm like, you know, I'm overreaching there a little. So I, I just, you know, I kind of started to look into things like how the Bible was put together mm -hmm. and so on, and then the. The translations, like, the this, the that. The yeah, and how just yeah. a bunch of people writing stories. And, exactly, yeah, yeah. and bit by bit, the conviction fell apart. Which I thought, well, maybe that'll give me a more honest belief based on a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of honest sort of doubt. Weirdly, you know, rather than just all these convictions that didn't really have any mm -hmm. intellectual bravery to them. It was a lot of intellectual cowardice, and you know. But anyway, it all fell apart. I didn't. I couldn't really put it back together again. Really. Um, but <clears throat> so, what then tends to happen is you go from being if you're a real believer, you become a real disbeliever. So I was a very vocal um, atheist. And I still am in the sense that I, atheism gets a hard rap because it, people think it has an agenda attached to it, which obviously it, it can do with certain mm -hmm. people, of course, or you know, individuals bring what they want to it. Just like, like anyone with any belief, yeah. Yeah, but like, I don't know, do you collect, do you collect stamps? No? I no. Take, no. So no. you are an aphilatelist, right? You could be described as an aphilatelist. Which doesn't mean anything. It's right. like, okay, but if people started to suggest that, like you held an agenda as an mm -hmm. aphilatelist, that that kind of, it, you know, it um, implied any kind of <coughs> anything, right. you know, it, you'd, you'd get sick of the, you know, sick sure, of the label. Sure. So I'm an atheist now, I don't believe in God. But now what I think is that I kind of see religion as like, well, 
at some point it really gave people the experience of transcendence. Somewhere in history, people were having <coughs> a, a kind of a, a phenomenological, like an experiential, embodied experience of, 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 of transcendence. That meant, like it meant something. It, that whatever was happening historically was there in living memory with people. Whatever this guy was talking about, whatever the experience was, and was like giving people a real thing. And then time moves on, and that thing moves out of living memory, whatever the sort of historical context was. And so to recreate it, you, 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 um, you introduce practices, things that you can do, rituals, rituals. and things that will, will just give you back a bit of that. <coughs> but of course, it's now, you're now moving into belief as opposed to a kind of embodied knowledge that it, that it was. And then that, you know, and dogmas start. All these things start mm -hmm. to kind of come in that are replacing what was actually a very, uh, you know, an, an experience. Yes. And then, you know, of course, that body, that church gets, you know, powerful and monetized and political, you know, so there's a whole lot of, and then, then you are where we are now, where, it, to me, a lot of the atheist arguments feel a little bit like it's that kind of straw man thing, like, of course you can point at some of where we are now and go, well, that's kind of silly, that's ridiculous, but I think to give religion its credit, it's, there's, it may not be doing a very good job at it now, but actually those things are signposts back to what is important, mm. which is the value of transcendence, which is only what we're talking about. All it means is, it doesn't have to mean anything overtly spiritual, it's just losing yourself to something bigger, which is what you're saying, right? Yes. What you've done turning... Uh, Service, yeah. Yeah, turning that thing of proving the bull is wrong to serving something bigger. And that's massive, but we don't, we don't instinctively get that that's a... Like a, that is an important thing. It takes people like you to mm. say this is a valuable thing and makes a difference, and we go, oh, does it? Okay, but actually, like that, which is why I think that the mythological side of religion is is important because these sorts of, uh, you know, that things have to die for new things to grow. You know, these are kind of re religious myths that mm -hmm. serve, I think, <coughs> this very basic need to transcend. Because when we don't put it somewhere valuable. We put it in, you know, the idea yeah. of money, wealth, yeah, fame, yeah. and so on, which don't serve it. They do not. Yeah. yeah, they don't serve it. They don't yeah. give you that. They don't give you that experience. So, you, you, so yeah. what is the what is the thing you believe the most then? And what is the thing you're, what's the meaning that you're giving that's bigger than you right now? If it's not God or religion or faith or in those things, I I, I think it's. Uh, I mean, this will sound very self-centered, but I think in as much as we can only sort ourselves out, can't we? You know, you've got to just sort yourself out yeah, and, and then before you even think about anybody else. So I, I, if there's anything in my life, it's trying to maintain the, the best possible, which is, does not mean perfect, just good enough, mm. kind of dialogue with myself and understanding of that. Yeah. So I can just do this thing uh, as well as I can, which is, you know, that's a life project and yeah. not one that's of any interest to anybody else. I don't expect it to be, but like that's, that's, sure. that's interesting enough. And then what's nice is taking stuff that, uh, that I do learn out of that and then like putting it into a book or putting yeah, it into yeah. a, into a project. People, that's yeah. nice. <clears throat> again, that is less about me. So that's right. where it gets valuable. Have you been able to answer the question about why you're here, where you're going? What's the point of all this? Have you been able to figure out a solution, a proof, a formula. I I, I I don't think they're helpful questions, really. I think the uh, I think what's the helpful bit is what's important to mm. us, and I think meaning is important. I think it's meaning is more important than happiness. We think it's happiness, but it's not. Meaning brings us joy. Me, yeah, me, meaning puts everything else into place. <clears throat> and the other part of that is that thing about tolerating like ambiguity, like the trouble with words like meaning, and uh, and happiness. And even words like the self is that they hide the fact they're not nouns, really. They're, they're verbs. These are active things. Like maybe well, there's no self. Maybe we just kind of self. Maybe our, what this is is something that happens in our relationships. And, uh, yeah, and, and happiness is maybe it's an activity and meaning is an activity, and th which means they're messy and they're complex and they're active. And that's, like, that's a, a tricky thing to mm. kind of <clears throat> maintain and hold yeah. in place. But I, I that, that, all that stuff is important yeah. to me. What about the thing you're most proud of? What's the thing you've done that you're most proud of that maybe, <clears throat> maybe a lot of people don't even know about? I, to be honest, it's, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is when I've done the show, like this show Sacrifice, sorry to mm -hmm. come back to it. But oh, the, it's all uh, good. Uh, Bring it up, man. I love thing, it. But, um, <laughs> in the show Sacrifice, this guy goes through 
a genuinely transformational experience that is has really changed him. And has he stuck and, with it? Yeah, yeah, and he wow. will tell you this. Because I did say to him, like, I'm going to probably do some promotional stuff around the show. Is it all right for me to say, what do you want me to say? He said, like, apart from having my kids, this is the best thing I've ever done. Wow. I do it in a heartbeat. And when you watch it, like, he's going through some dark stuff. So you wouldn't necessarily take that for granted that he would say that. So given that television and entertainment can be such a kind of, you know, ludicrous, Produced. Uh, ludicrous meaning, or just as a meaningless yeah, kind yeah. of uh, experience, um, to occasionally do things like that that make a difference. Mm -hmm. That, I think in terms of feeling proud of anything, that's all I can really think of. I don't feel, really feel proud of things that relate back to me because that's not as interesting, mm. but because it's like... Helping someone else, yeah. Yeah, and not in a kind of like a, you know, not in a trying to make myself sound anything, sure. but just but genuinely, it, it's, it's much easier to feel proud of something when yeah. it isn't, and it isn't about you, mm -hmm. and it's something that's, you know, you're gonna probably feel proud of your kids than you're gonna feel right, about right. your own like business right, achievements. Right. I think that would be, yeah, that would be normal. Yeah. Your kids like spelling bee, then you're like, yeah, 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 amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the thing that you've been thinking about maybe for a while that you haven't been able to create yet? Uh, an experiment, a, a performance, a trick, a, you know? I don't really have them. I, I, um, I just sit when, it, when there's a time for a new project, I just sit and think, wow. what's interesting now? What's wow. Because I've got to live with the thing for like 10 months. So I, if it's some idea from a, somewhere in the back of my mind from three years ago, it's not going to be interesting. And I'll have grown up since then. Wow. So, so no, I don't. I have no ideas You're very and present. no ambitions. <laughs> You're very present, yeah. Until you come up with an idea, then you start acting on it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And you're... What's your favorite hobbies? Is it art? Because you're an amazing I paint. painter. Your your work is unbelievable, man. Oh, thank like you. Like you're like thank a professional, like a real like <laughs> oh, thank not you. just like some amateur. It's like <clears throat> check out your uh, his stuff on his website. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, I paint and take photographs. Though. That's, that's your main that's, thing. That's yeah. My main thing yeah. What is it about both those things that you love the most? It's that flow thing we were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but that again, that could be anything. That might as well be surfing, I guess. But that it definitely gives me that. Um, uh, I have a very public job, so they're, they're also quite private things. And I, because I, I'm naturally quite introverted, mm -hmm. really, I'm quite shy. Like, you've, I don't know, you'd probably describe yourself maybe as a bit shy, even though, like, your personality right, right, might right. be very extrovert. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of generally quite shy. So, there are things that they sit well with me. Like, I, I, photographers, I do street photography, so I'm kind of out, like, taking. Mm -hmm. Just candy Moments. pictures at moment, yeah. you know. But you're, yeah, and you're kind of in an interesting mental space because you're kind of you're separated and you're kind of detached, but you're also um, very open and engaged. And in the UK, because I'm quite well known, mm -hmm. I sort of it, it, I I used to naturally if I went it. out yeah. keep my head down, and now I don't. I'm kind of like open and engaged. And of course, <laughs> no one's no one's stopping me or anything. That was like another <laughs> fiction I was living out in my head. But um. Uh, it's a really lovely, it's mm. a great state of mind. It's that, and again, I think it's that easy, mm. that something about yeah. that X equals light, like you're, you're just a step back, but you're also very open, mm. and it's a very porous state. I think that's yeah. a very nice that's cool. place to be. A couple final questions for mm. you. This has been fascinating, so I appreciate you all opening this is, up I've everything. enjoyed this so much. Thank this. you for having me. Go on. Um, this question is called the three truths that I asked everyone at the end. Okay. And so I'd like for you to imagine for a moment that you get to pick the last day for you that you're going to be on this earth, right? It's your last day, as many years out as you want to live. Wow, okay. Right? It's yeah. whatever, you're 100, you're 200, it doesn't matter, mm. whatever age you are. And you've done everything that you want to do. You, you only think 10 months out, so you do everything in 10 month increments, mm. but you've done yeah. it all, right? You're happy with your life, yeah. essentially. You've created the work, the shows, the anything you want to do, you've done it. You've got the relationship with your partner, you've had the family if you want that, whatever it is, you've done it. Um, and it's been a great life. But for whatever reason, all the work that you put out into the world, you've got to take it with you. Your books, your shows, you know, the amazing shows on Netflix. As in like none of it's going to exist after It's not going to exist. You've got to take yeah, it with yeah. you sure, sure. and it goes into yeah. wherever you go next. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you get to leave the world with your three final truths. You've got a piece of paper and a pen, you get to write it down. Uh, or maybe it's a hologram at that point, who knows what it is. But you get to give them the world three lessons back to the world that you know to be true from your life experience okay. that could benefit them or serve them in some way. Okay. What would be your three truths? Uh, I'm probably going to be repeating myself because I think I'd probably uh, 
said everything that I think to be yeah, true during this interview. Yeah. I'd say, uh, um, don't try and control the things you can't control. Uh, the stuff you feel shame about, no one really cares. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, flossing. I think flossing is a good one. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, make sure you guys watch Sacrifice which is on Netflix right now. It's all over the world too, right? You can watch it. It is, it is all over the world. Not just US, but anywhere Netflix. Yeah, yeah, it's on, yeah, worldwide. it's like, yeah. It's so if it's amazing. not on the home page of your Netflix, just type in sacrifice. I think it has an exclamation point. I think point. once you've watched it, it's on your home page every time it's you see it. Then it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's riveting, yeah. So go there, watch it like tonight. I'm telling you, watch this thing. It's only 60 minutes, I think it's not. It's like, not even that, it's like 40, 40, 47 minutes. It's You don't want it to end, I'm telling you guys. You do not want it to end. So go watch it right now, sacrifice. Then you're going to go down the rabbit hole. I'm already going to tell you. I'm going to get people messaging me on Instagram stories, tagging me like on your YouTube, just watching every video after this. There's a lot there. Watch sacrifice. Then do yourself the favor and watch the push right yeah. afterwards. Oh my goodness, it's crazy. Well, the moment when people were the moment when people were kicking the box. Oh god, yeah. It sounds like, really dark out of context. I can't believe watching this stuff. The last five minutes of the show is just amazing. Watching it's crazy, man. It's unbelievable. Sorry, uh, watch the push afterwards. <laughs> it's crazy, it's gonna blow your mind. Uh, and then watch your uh, your stage show, which is called Miracles. Is Miracle is the Miracle. stage show that's on Netflix it's as amazing. well. Yeah. So watch the three, uh, three shows tonight, I'm telling you, you're gonna love it. Um, I would acknowledge you for a moment, Darren, for uh, bringing so much joy to so many people, whether it's on stage or if it's at home. Like for, for so long you brought joy and intrigue and wonder and creativity into people's lives when they don't have it. And I, and I truly say this from an honest place that you bring a lot of people hope and inspiration for a better version of themselves, whatever that looks like for them, by showing people what's possible and by showing people that their way of thinking doesn't have to stay that way. So your quirkiness, your you know struggles from childhood to obsessing over certain things of trying to impress people is paying off in a massive way through your creative service. And I really acknowledge that and appreciate you. So That's an amazing thing to hear. Thank you yeah, so much. Of course, of course. Uh, I have one final question for you, and that is what is your definition of greatness? Of greatness? Living in easy accordance with fate. And by fate, I mean fortune and stuff that happens mm. every day. Wow. Darren Brown, thank you so much, man. A thank gentle you handshake. So, so much. To end yeah, the night. I was actually gripping you hard. It was a grip. That was a good one. Man. Thank you for sparing my poor British. <laughs> soft Appreciate hand. it, man. Oh, and where can we where can we connect with you online? Where do you hang um, out on social media? I'm also on Twitter, which is at D Darren Brown. D it's an unusual name. It's D E R R E N. Darren Brown. Um, I'm on Instagram too. I'm mainly about my photography and painting on that's Instagram. That's great stuff on there. And my yeah. website is darrenbrown.co.uk. Yeah, yeah, okay. Annoyingly, because someone's sitting on darrenbrown.com out there uh, and they won't let it go. Go buy it, yeah. <laughs> Make sure you guys follow Darren on uh, all social media accounts. Uh, which one do you hang out on the most? Probably Twitter. Twitter. Oh, yeah. So send him a tweet, retweet this um, uh, link to your friends, and um, check out Sacrifice the Push. Uh, and the other show. So, Darren, thanks again, man. Appreciate it. Thank you it. so, so much.